Um, hello, my name is David McDowell Blue, uh, among other things, a playwright who has adapted both Joseph Sheridan and Lefanu's Carmilla, as well as Bram Stoker's most famous novel. This is supposed to be live. I have recorded this just in case something happens to my internet, just to be on the safe side. Now, I am assuming pretty much anyone attending this kind of event realizes just how many adaptations of the novel Dracula are out there, or at least some notion. Being a playwright and a fan of all things Gothic and specifically undead, the time came when I wanted to toss out my own version. The question immediately comes to mind, why? <laughs> we'll not address the raw arrogance of this ambition here. Instead, the focus will be on a different question, namely, how in the name of all things unholy does one come up with an original take on this novel? Well, here is what I did. May it prove useful and or informative and or entertaining in some way. First, some aspects of the story always did call to me. One which I regard as central is a mystery about the characters, namely, for example, why would this fascinating, intelligent, vibrant woman, Mina Murray, be so obviously and fiercely in love with a dull, pedantic, unimaginative clerk like Jonathan Harker? Remember, now I'm a writer. And in adapting another person's work, such as I have done before, the original characters become mine, inevitably. Otherwise, I'm just editing and transcribing someone else's text, which does not interest me, even if it hadn't already been done many times with varying degrees of success. Now, I approached this mystery by looking more closely at the text. I should mention I have zero problems with making radical changes while adapting a work, but the purpose of such changes should not be to simply make the work my own. I mean, that will happen no matter what, nor to change for the sake of something exciting, although that can be valid. I am instead trying to dive deeper into the source material, mine it for something new to be brought further into the light. Ironic turn of phrase. And I struck pay dirt once I simply forgot about all the other versions of Harker, focusing on Stokers. Please recall, this man escaped from Castle Dracula. Well, that's no mean feat. More, he did it by climbing out a castle window, descending a cliff all by himself without proper climbing tools then surviving by himself in the wolf-infested Transylvanian wilderness for at least a week. Well, this created a whole new picture of the man in my mind. Just to give a visceral example, I sometimes cast characters in my mind from films or TV shows just to give me an image or a seed to help my mind picture a character. At first, I had cast in my mind as Jonathan Harker, Daniel Radcliffe, as he appeared in the film The Woman in Black. It makes sense, don't you think? Young solicitor out of his depth, Victorian era, but bravely seeking to do his duty and protect his loved ones. Yeah, sure. But in light of my re-examining the character, realizing here is someone of great physical strength, someone not only brave, but tough, single-minded, polite, but not even remotely timid or weak-willed. And a new bit of virtual casting came into my mind, namely Kit Harrington, who played Jon Snow from the series Game of Thrones. Not decrying Mr. Radcliffe in any way, nor comparing the two in terms of acting ability, but this idea of Harker made a lot of sense to me. Manly man, someone from a scrabble farm, 
who made himself a lawyer by hard work and his own will. Not unlike Abraham Lincoln, someone who would more easily not only attempt to destroy a centuries old vampire, but have much greater odds at succeeding. One in truth, it seems easier to believe Mina would be quite so gobsmacked over. Along the way, I also now imagined him with a Yorkshire accent. I saw to approach, approach pretty much all the characters in this way, especially and most importantly, the human ones, because after all, and most of the story does not focus on Dracula himself, but rather his impact on this circle of what became very close friends. Towards the end, I just could not believe Dr. Jack Seward would not resent Arthur Holmwood for getting the girl they both loved. Again, this is about doing a deeper dive into characters. I cannot but imagine genuine tension between Arthur and Jack over both loving the same woman. There would be tension there. You know, likewise, I found myself imagining Quincy as a very dangerous individual, a gunslinger rather than a cowboy, less Audie Murphy and more a young Clint Eastwood in those spaghetti westerns from the 1960s. So we, or rather you know, I, have this desire to dive more deeply into the characters, and that is what I did. I will add, the published notes from Bram Stoker made in the early stages of his writing, which was published in 2013, proved a quite nifty research tool, especially when I decided to make Renfield a woman. And this needed to give her a female attendant at the asylum found the basis of that character in those very notes, namely Kate Reed, who was at school with Lucy and Mina. Yes, Kim Newman used her first. My iteration of this character is very much herself, so I feel not one drop of guilt. Why make Renfield a woman? Because I wanted to. Because the, I thought the story has too few women in it, and which frankly is a major complaint I have with a lot of fiction. Plus, women outnumber men in every audition I've ever attended. And I thought the dynamic between Renfield and her doctor then shifts in an interesting way. But what really hung me up about writing my own version of Dracula remained indeed the title character. We have seen the decaying monster who vaguely regrets his lost humanity. We have seen the charming acolyte of darkness out to recruit so-called disciples to his cause. Likewise, the 400-year-old bully slash rapist, a common but extremely dull version of the Count in my own personal view. Bon vivant, Ironic hero, delusional messiah, seeker after vengeance against God, the plotter to take over the world, um, a world-weary warlord who does not understand the modern world. All versions we've seen sooner or later, or at least I have. Therefore, here was my biggest stumbling block in writing my own adaptation. Who was my Dracula? Some will say at this point, just follow Bram Stoker's lead. Yeah, well, that is far easier said. For one thing, while a talented man, Stoker was demonstrably not a great novelist. He caught lightning in a bottle to create this horror classic, but never came in anywhere close to doing it again. And it isn't as if the book is without flaws. One of those, from not from a reader's point of view, but from an adapter's, is how Dracula himself remains a cipher. We don't get a lot of insight into Dracula's personality, save on a very surface level. level. Um, this book is less character-driven than plot-driven. And 
personal opinion, theme-driven. Besides, if anyone was going to want to see a new Dracula play, I feel strongly they have no real reason to, unless that said play offered something new. I tried my hand at various ideas along those lines. It, it, believe me, finding a new take on Dracula is not as easy as it sounds. Does it sound easy, by the way? Not to me. Anyway, some ideas included, for example, a steampunk version of the story, or one set in the American Confederacy. I considered making Lucy and Mina lovers, turning them into the central romance of the story, explicitly changing Dracula into a woman, switching everyone's gender. By the way, anyone who likes any of these notions, please feel free to use them as you will. Ultimately, none of them clicked with me. But then, there is an artistic motif going back centuries dubbed Death and the Maiden. One very famous version is an 1841 painting by Horace Vernet on the subject. I recommend Googling it. Horace Vernet, V-E-R-N-E-T, uh, Death and the Maiden. Or the motif in general. It's very interesting stuff and not given to simplicity. There's an enormous amount of nuance there. Central to this motif is an idea, a vision of death itself, or if you will, the angel of death, as one who woos and ultimately wins a young woman's love. An interesting idea to personify the grim reaper not in the role of the pitiless ender of each individual life, but instead a suitor. Death as Romeo. Or if you prefer Othello, or both. But contemplating the many, many works of art associated with death and the maiden, an idea came to mind. Well, not a light bulb, but perhaps more a candle. After 400 years, would Dracula even think of himself as a human being at all? What would he think of himself in terms of ethnicity or human politics or even gender? How might the world seem to such a creature? What might they desire? How much of those long centuries might they have forgotten? This excited me. It intrigued me more. It gave me a very technical anchor around which to write the entire piece. Because if Dracula is death, death personified, in effect, an angel of death who bears no malice, but functions as a force of nature, then every single person in the play will have a specific relationship to Dracula automatically. They will relate to the vampire precisely as each relates to death. One is frankly in denial about death, at least in regards himself and his. Another welcomes it as an ease to suffering. Still another reacts with abject terror while someone else, a doctor, sees death as the ultimate enemy, to be fiercely combated with every weapon and tactic available. Then again, someone else tries to become death, to become in their own mind what Dracula already is. Others use faith, a way of understanding, and in the process, judging. Every single character came into focus with specific points of view governing their reactions to nearly every single word. More within that framework, the characters came alive in ways that startled and delighted. They began to do and say things I did not plan. Non-writer here, non-writers here might at this point <laughs> question my sanity. 
I don't blame you. But many a playwright and novelist will back me up here. Writing a story, even an adaptation, hopefully reaches the point when the characters are so alive, so vivid, so individually complete, although almost never fully you know, consciously, within my own mind, they seem to act with volition, including, yes, Dracula himself. It startled and pleased me beyond words when my version of the Count began asking people after he reaches Whitby, are you why I am here? Because, and I truly did not realize this until Dracula said it, he himself does not know the reason he came to England. Just the implications of that prove slightly mind-boggling. But once he said those words, almost instantly, I understood quite a bit more about this specific incarnation of the Count. It also gave me, ultimately, a title for my play. The Wings of Dracula. After all, he has wings. Like a demon. Or an angel. Which, when you think about it, are pretty much the same thing. According to Christian belief, anyway. So this really told me on a fundamental level in what way the Count defined himself. Who was he in his own mind? And if he thinks of himself as death, how does he face the prospect of he himself maybe dying? Asking exactly those questions is how I myself came to reinvent Dracula. Thank you.